Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Gregory Tolle, who is Professor of Experimental Cosmology and Astrophysics at the University of Michigan. Professor Tolle's research focuses on the nature of dark energy and dark matter and the acceleration and sources of cosmic rays. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So um, our discussion today, mostly about dark energy, and uh, we talked a bit about dark energy in previous episodes, but um, I, I'm still somewhat confused about it. So, so, so correct me if I am wrong. Uh, in spite of the physicist's best efforts, um, we have a good idea of only about 5% of the universe. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, and um, 70% of the universe is what we call dark energy, and another 25% is dark matter. And, and we say it's 70% because of E equal to mc squared. So we're taking essentially the, the entire content of the universe, that 5% is really the matter that we, we can see and know. Um, the other 95%, uh, so we are converting everything into some sort of a standard metric, right? Energy. Mm-hmm. That- why we are calling it 70% of the universe? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we we now know that the universe is uh, spatially flat on on large scales. And that's incredibly interesting because uh, um, very early on, uh, you know, Einstein showed that the geometry of of the universe, the geometry of space-time, is critically dependent upon its content. And so in the early days, you know, m- many years ago, many decades ago, um, the belief was that there wasn't enough matter to make the universe, um, uh, you know, uh, flat. It wasn't enough to close the universe. And uh, then, uh, and, and so, because they, 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 you know they, they looked at stars and galaxies and they added up the density of matter in the universe and it just came up short. Yeah. And uh, then uh, they discovered um, dark matter and uh, what they found was that galaxies, that uh, parts of galaxies, hydrogen clouds and stars in the outer reaches of galaxies were orbiting the center of those galaxies at uh, speeds that were, uh, that indicated there was more matter than just what met the eye, you know, the visible matter, the stars and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, it was realized that there's a significant amount of dark matter in the universe. And at that time, in the early days, they didn't know whether it was cold or hot dark matter. Cold dark matter is matter that's moving slowly uh, in the early universe. Um, and hot dark matter was matter that's moving quickly. And they, uh, by looking at large scale structure in the universe, they discovered that most of this dark matter was indeed cold, that it was moving slowly. And since it's moving slowly, uh, not relativistically, then it had to be made up of particles. But those particles weren't, hadn't been, they still haven't been discovered. And so 
uh, it's a mystery as to what this dark matter is. You know, is it a new type of particle? Is it in, you know, uh, some people suggest that supersymmetry might be the source of these uh, um, particles. But uh, so far, they haven't found that particle, either in accelerators or in underground experiments. There are massive attempts now to try to find the dark matter um, uh, you know, particle. And uh, these, are, these are ongoing. And I guess there are a few candidates, uh, like, like the WIMP, uh, mm -hmm. weakly interacting massive particle, and others. Uh, but, but what do you mean by flat universe, Greg? Well, what I mean is that it is that the density of stuff in the universe, matter and energy, adds up at the present time to what would be required to uh, so that the universe expands forever, but uh, but asymptotically um, slows down. Hmm. And that's if, if the universe is only made of matter. Yeah. Uh, so that's called the critical density. And uh, before they thought that uh, the universe would, you know, expand forever, slowing down only slightly, but never stopping. Uh, and, uh, you know, there had been speculations that maybe you had more than, you know, before that we knew more than the critical density, in which case the universe would slow down, stop and start contracting. Uh, but it didn't appear that that was the case. And now we know, and, and, and as I said before, as Einstein showed that the that the fate of the universe is tied to its geometry, but the geometry is tied to its content, and the content is determined by the density of what's in it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the studies of dark matter, looking at large-scale structure in the universe, you know, the, 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 how, much, how much stuff you have on small scales versus large scales, seem to indicate that there was a significant amount of dark matter, mm -hmm. but but not enough to close the universe, not enough to make it flat. And um, so, uh, uh, but, but uh, more recently, uh, they discovered that the universe uh, is indeed flat. And they did this by looking at the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation and the acoustic peak, the first, the peak in that, in that power spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation showed that the universe was at exactly the critical density. Hmm. So then the question became, if, if indeed the dark matter makes up 30% of the universe, yeah. and as indicated by the large scale structure, what's the other 70% made up of? And the answer to that came when in 1998, two groups studying um, type one supernova uh, and they use them as standard candles to determine the, uh, uh, the Hubble parameter as a function of time. Uh, and they, uh, they found that the universe was not slowing down under the influence of the matter that it contained, but in fact, it was accelerating. It was, it was, the expansion was getting faster and faster. And, uh, and in you know, something around five, six billion years ago, uh, this new stuff that's causing this expansion dominated over the matter in the universe and has been ever since. And it's been increasing its share ever since. Yeah. And the name given to this was dark energy. Yeah, so um, this universe is exactly or close to the critical density. Um, is, that, that, that sounds like there is some sort of fine tuning, is it? Well, uh, Actually, um, that, that's the problem with this. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem. The problem is uh, that for the density of the universe to be not infinite or zero at this time, it had to be very, very, very close. So one part in 10 to the 60th mm. uh, it, in the early universe, uh, close to, so it had to differ from one by, you know, 10 to the minus 60. Yeah. And that is a mystery. Now, I, that, that it has not been explained. Yeah. Um, because you would expect that if there were some sort of cancellation that took place, like happens in particle physics, uh, that would uh, get rid of these infinities, these very large numbers, um, that that would make it zero. Hmm. It wouldn't make it, you know you know, one part in 10 to the 120, which is the apparently the, 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 
the value you get today. Yeah. So that that's a mystery and it has not been solved. And I don't think we will solve it until we understand the nature of this dark energy. So does it, uh, does it give some direction to the multiverse uh, idea that we, we find the universe as, as it is because we, because we are here and most other cases uh, we would not have been here, right? As well, we, yeah, we, cer we certainly would not have been here if there was much more uh, dark energy or um, uh, much, much less density in the universe. Yeah, uh, but do you buy that? Uh, so you know, it it, it uh, appears to be just kind of a special iteration of many many possibilities, and uh, it's just that uh, we could we couldn't exist in most of the other situations, and and hence we shouldn't be too surprised. We find these parameters to be reasonably finely tuned for us. Yeah, I you know. I don't, I don't, I just don't know the answer to that. And I think that uh, what's needed is, um, is more, more data. Understanding that, I think by understanding the nature of, the dark, of dark energy, uh, measuring it with high precision, measuring its effect with high precision, we will ultimately, you know, understand uh, the, well, we'll know the answers to these questions. Yeah. And you have been involved with multiple experiments. Uh, the earlier one uh, was the dark energy survey that, that concluded recently. I know that uh, results are still being analyzed. There was some readout, uh, sort of a one-year readout? Yes. At one year, uh, the results have been published. And uh, uh, the, um, well, it, it worked incredibly well. <laughs> and it worked as, as to expectations. Uh, now, the dark energy survey is what's called an imaging survey. And so as a result, it, it, takes, it basically takes photographs of the, of the sky, uh, you know, something like 60,000 galaxies at a time. Mm. And uh, it does it in, and it, it, it repeats these observations in, through multiple filters, so it gets different colors. Yeah. And so you can tell where things are in right ascension, declination, you know, uh, very well, but the measuring things photometrically means that you have to get the redshift by comparing the intensities of a particular galaxy that you get in the different filters. Mm -hmm. It's called photo Z, photo redshift. Yeah. And this, it, it works, but it does not work as well as we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives us a measure of the redshift to about, oh, a little, little, just a little better than 10%. But there are big tails on the distributions, and so there are things which we call uh, uh, catastrophic errors in the redshift yeah. that make it difficult to to actually measure the three dimensional structure of matter in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but the, what Desi has going for it is that it has multiple techniques for measuring the um, the effect of dark energy on on the uh, universe. And um, the multiple techniques can be combined to give it more power in understanding dark energy. Yeah, so, so this those, survey. Yeah, go ahead. The, the photometric survey that, that you described. So are the errors sort of the function of distance? Yes. The, the further we look, uh, the more uh, error prone it might be? Well, yes. Uh, well, we're measuring, we're measuring redshift. Yeah. Uh, there, <laughs> interestingly enough, you get more measurements at larger distances because there's a larger volume out there. Yeah. And so that compensates for the, uh, for the, uh, you know, the, the fact that the objects are brighter closer in. Yeah. So, so yes, we are limited by how far we can see, you know, uh, but, uh, but uh, there's more. There's more of the stuff out there, so we we can see more, and that statistically gives us an advantage. Yeah. So, so I was wondering, uh, Greg, uh, from an instrumentation perspective, um, 
is there any, any sort of error correction methodology you could use? If it, I guess these are not really linear, right? Uh, no, we, we, we eventually basically, we, we run out of galaxies and we at, at high redshift, because uh, at redshift of, uh, certainly the redshift of three is when galaxy formation began. And so we run out of galaxies, but we also run out of light. Yeah. And, you know, the, the only reason things can be seen at redshifts greater, you know, much larger redshifts is because we see quasars, which are putting out so much energy, hmm. so much light. So uh, could you talk at, at a very high level dark energy survey? Um, did we meet objectives? Do we have a better view as to uh, sort of the initial assumptions are valid? Yes. We certainly have verified, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've measured the Hubble constant. We've measured, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, with great, you know, gr great accuracy. We've measured in many different ways, actually. And um, it's and we've measured the uh, um, uh, the equation of state of dark energy. Uh, and uh, we've measured, uh, um you know, we, we, we've, we've gotten the first indications of, of whether or not there's a difference between dark energy, amount of dark energy that you measure um, uh, when, you're, when you're using techniques that involve the growth of structure versus the growth of the universe. And this is very important because the dark energy, the dark energy could, it could very well be a uh, a vacuum energy. In other words, empty space is not empty. It actually contains an energy. You know, in ni in, in 1905, uh, Einstein showed that uh, that matter has energy content. You know, he wrote down the equation uh, m equals e over c squared. Yeah. And uh, and uh, he determined that uh, matter has energy content until dark energy. energy. No one ever imagined that empty space cleared of everything you can imagine, all the fields, everything you can imagine, would have, you know, cleared of all the matter and, and, and fields and everything, would, have, would have, have an energy content. But in fact, that's one of the leading ideas as to what the dark energy is. It's, it's that empty space actually has energy to it. And that's why it's called dark energy. Um, what that means is that it's a property of the vacuum. It's a property of nothing, <laughs> and uh, and that's pretty cool, uh, because as the universe expands, you get more of it. Right, and, and so yeah, so that the more empty space there is, the more dark energy there is. So it's sort of a runaway process, right? Uh, it, it starts to get bigger and bigger faster. That's right. Uh, you get, and, and that's why it dominates now. In the early universe, when the universe had not expanded a great deal, uh, matter dominated the, the universe. But as we know, matter dilutes, you know, as the volume. So as the volume gets larger and larger, uh, the matter dilutes. Uh, the density of matter in the universe will decrease as the volume of, of, of any piece of space becomes larger. Uh, yeah. And so, but dark energy, if it's a property of empty space, if it's a property of the vacuum, will stay either constant or vary somewhat, but it won't dilute with the volume. And as a result, at some point it takes over. And that appears to have happened about five or six billion years ago. Yeah, so is, is, there, a, is there an intuition behind that, Greg? You know, why would empty space have energy content? Yeah. Well, that's that's the million dollar question, of course, yeah. right? And um, the 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 elementary particle theorists yeah. would tell you that there are virtual particles being created and destroyed, you know, being created and annihilated um, continuously in empty space. Yeah. Uh, this is this is the the way in which particles um, acquire their mass, probably their charge. Um, and uh, that particles are born massless, but then they interact with this field, which we now know is the Higgs field, and uh, they acquire they acquire a mass. Okay, and uh, so you could imagine that empty space um, could acquire a mass 
by virtue of elementary particles being uh, pair, pair, you know, uh, uh, particle antiparticle pairs, virtual ones being created all the time. Yeah. But the problem with this is that the particles, the particle mass that would be created, and the particle volume that would be created by each of these virtual particles, you know, you 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 would imagine that it would be something like uh, the the uh, Planck mass, which is the mass at which gravity and the other forces kind of unify. And so if you assume that there are virtual Planck mass particles uh, being created and destroyed constantly in empty space, a kind of foam, you know, that fills, that fills the vacuum, uh, you get an answer uh, that the density of such stuff should be 120 times, 120 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 120 times bigger than what we measure. And so I would say that that theory has to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a big mistake, right? <laughs> Ten well, to unless, unless there is some sort of a compensating mechanism that we have. Exactly. We have. And that's why it's so peculiar that we don't get zero. Yeah. And that we get something like one part in 10 to the 120. And so uh, there have been... The, the the theoretical attempts to explain the nature of dark energy have basically failed. Yeah. And it's really up to the experimentals at this point. And the, the technique that we think will give us the most information is to see how dark energy has changed, if it has changed over time. Right. Now, there's another possibility besides it being some sort of vacuum energy. Uh, due to some new field that we don't know about yet it could you know which you know who, who knows what that field might be it might be the say it might be related to the field that caused the universe to to grow in the first place to inflate yeah uh, but uh the other possibility is that there are that there is a modification to gravity and uh in other words general relativity is not exactly correct and uh we have to modify gravity now in recent years the discovery of of uh, merging uh, black holes through, you know, through gravitational wave detection uh, has really, uh, it's, it, it means that general relativity actually works in the strong field limit. Yeah. And so there, you know, given that there have been many tests of general relativity in the weak field limit that, have, you know, verified, it's, it verified it. And now we have tests of general relativity in a very strong field limit, you know, with merging black holes. It, it's in my mind, it's becoming less and less um, uh, probable that uh, there's a modification to gravity. But one of the things that these dark energy experiments can do is by measuring things that depend on the growth of structure versus things that depend upon the growth of the universe and comparing them, we can figure out if there's a modification to gravity or whether it's, you know, due to some sort of uh, you know, vacuum energy density. Yeah, so so we have two problems. The vacuum energy density, as you mentioned, uh, is off uh, from theory to experiment uh, by 120 orders of magnitude, right? Mm -hmm. so something else there. Um, from, uh, you're saying from a, a theory of relativity and other established uh, theories, recent experiments, recent observations, I should say, gravity waves and others seem to confirm what we know, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so the third option that you mentioned, uh, a field that we haven't really uh, recognized yet, is that becoming more of a, a stronger hypothesis now? Um, well, the field would give vacuum energy to the universe. So they all fall under that kind of category yeah. of producing vacuum energy. It, it, the, the field, remember fields are made up of particles. Yeah. And so if, the, it, but if there is a field, if, 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 if there's a new field that has a particle associated with it, uh, that is uh, of lower mass, then uh, maybe, you know, maybe that's the, the cause of it. And, but it, it all falls under the category vacuum energy because it, you would have virtual particle, antiparticle pairs being created. It would, it would form the density, the dark energy density of the universe. 
Yeah, without knowing anything about it, Greg, I'm beginning to feel that there is somebody kind of moving this dials around just to make it interesting. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> we we certainly don't have a clue, <laughs> and, and 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 that's why that's why it's so interesting to actually do experiments and see because you see any any measurement that measures the competition between gravity trying to pull space time together and dark energy trying to fling space-time apart. Uh, and if you can do that as a function of distance, and of dis distance is time. So distance is, you know, you're looking further and further back in time. So if you can measure the, that competition and see if, it, if, it, uh, if things are changing over time, uh, you, know, in the, in the dark, you know, for the dark energy, then that would give us very powerful clues as to what its nature is. Yeah, so the, um, the complication there is that the time windows that we take measurements are really narrow, I would think, right? Can we? Oh, it's significant. The universe has expanded by a factor of over a thousand, a little over a thousand since uh, the what's called recombination when, when atoms formed in the early universe. Yeah. And so we can, you know, measure a good over a good fraction of cosmic time. Uh, the comp this competition that took place. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, uh, that's what DESI and, and, and the Dark Energy Survey and the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument uh, have attempted to do, are okay. attempting to do. Yeah, let's talk about that. So DESI, Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. So that's the more recent, um, recent venture. And um, th that is sort of uh, trying to get a 3D picture of the universe. Absolutely. That's the point. Yeah. The point is that um, uh, what we want to do is we, um, le le let me start from the very beginning. <laughs> In the early universe, there were you know, all sorts of fluctuations that were caused, you know, quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And they created sound, which propagated out from those fluctuations uh, until atoms formed at about uh, 380,000 years after the launch of the universe. Yeah. When atoms, for, in, in the plasma of the early universe, which is just consists of, you know, mostly hydrogen, uh, 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 nuclei, protons, and... Uh, and electrons, which were free and roaming free from those, you know, just like in a in a in a discharge lamp, you know, like a you know, you, you have a plasma, and in a plasma, the speed of sound, um, tra sound travels at about the speed of light over the square root of three. And so, from the very beginning, those those fluctuations created sound, which propagated out to a known distance when atoms formed, yeah. and that's called the sound horizon. Now, that sound horizon. If you look back to the time when atoms formed, forms a um, uh, but basically puts a ruler on the sky, uh, and that ruler is about one degree uh, angular size, and that's why you see a one degree peak in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Mm. Now, since that time, since atoms formed, those fluctuations, which are at the level of one part in ten to the five grew into the unity scale fluctuations that we see today. When you see galaxies and galaxy clusters, uh, you can actually look at the distances between galaxies and measure this preferential scale, which grew from that early time to the, how big it is today, which is you know, on the order of 120, you know, 130 megaparsecs. Yeah. And you can see that, that feature on the sky today at about 130, you know, at about 130 megaparsecs. Now, that feature grew from the time when microwave background was, uh, 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 when the microwave background radiation was released at the time when atoms formed. Uh, and those, the, the, the fluctuations that were present at that time, which were, you know, as I said, one part in 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 5, yeah. they formed the, the structure, the underlying structure that the galaxies formed in. And so the galaxies are kind of like decorating this cosmic web of dark matter. Mm -hmm. And they, there are more galaxies where there's more matter because it fell in gravitationally. So, matter. so, so you, you think, by measuring the distance between galaxies, yeah. distance between galaxies and looking at that, dis that distribution, you can actually measure this so-called baryon acoustic oscillation feature mm -hmm. uh, as, as time goes on. And you can see how gravity competed with dark energy. 
Yeah. And, and so could, could you describe sort of the mechanics of this? So what okay. are the decisions that you take and how do you combine them to ultimately get this, uh, okay. get, get the information? Okay. So as I said, on the dark energy survey, we take pictures, you know, photometric uh, pictures of many galaxies at one time. And we look at the, their different colors and we try to determine the Z axis, the, 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 uh, uh, how far away they are from us yeah. by, by using their, their colors and uh, measuring their redshift. But that's not the best way to measure the distance. Uh, it's, um, it, it produces an error, which is on the scale of the current BAO feature size. What we'd like to do is we'd like to actually measure spectra of all of these galaxies. Um, and by measuring the spectra, we can look at spectral lines, we can look at quasars, uh, what's called the Lyman Alpha Forest, and we can measure uh, redshift much more accurately. And so we get a much more complete 3D uh, image, a much more complete view of the structure of the universe than we could photometrically. And so the, the key with DESI is trying to find a way to measure tens of millions when we're going to try to get 35 million galaxy spectra measured with DESI. And that means that we have to actually send the light from those galaxies into a spectrograph. And um, the way we do that is kind of interesting. What we do is we have a whole bunch of little robots that move fibers around on, a fo on the focal plane, which is oh, about a meter in size. <laughs> and um, there are 5,000 of those in the DESI focal plane. And those little robots, um, they move the fibers around to the positions that we determine the galaxies that we want to look at are at. Yeah. And then we take spectra 5,000 at a time every 15 minutes. Uh, whenever the sky is dark, <laughs> we measure you know, more and more galaxies. 5,000 at a time, and over a five-year period, we'll accumulate but roughly 35 million of these spectra. And, and you're taking multiple measurements, right? So you said every 15 minutes you take a measurement? Yeah, we take 5,000 measurements, 5,000 spectra. In, in one direction? Uh, in one direction. Then we move to a new direction and measure that. And so DESI is at Kitt Peak. Uh, and it's 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 completely built now, and it's uh, it's gone. It's going through the final stages of what's called survey validation, which says yes, it's working as expected. We will be able to get the science out that we want. Uh, and next month, we are likely to start uh, survey operations, which means the five year five year measurements, five years of, of operations. Anyway, so the way Desi. Uh, as I said, the way that Desi does this is it has all these little robots, um, and uh, I'm kind of proud of this because I, 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 my group built the robots. <laughs> yeah. My group built the robots for Desi. And yeah. I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. Uh, they're working very well. Uh, and then what happens is you have fiber, fiber optics, that goes something like 50 meters down over the axes of the telescope down to, the, to this room where you have 10 500 channel spectrographs, which each one has three bands and can measure the redshift to, a, to you know, better than a part per thousand. Yeah. And yeah. in doing that, we can measure the, the positions of these galaxies in three dimensional space very accurately. And that means we can, if we have 35 million galaxies, basically we have 35 million squared divided by two uh, pairs of, distances to, to measure. Hmm. This is a challenging information processing problem too, I would imagine. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we are using supercomputers to digest the data every night. Yeah. As it comes in, real time. And so uh, at some point in the future, we would be able to see sort of a, a 3D map. We can maybe um, virtually move through, I would imagine, a 3D map of a, a big swath of the, the sky, right? Is that the right. That's the idea. Yeah. So, and, so in order to do this measurement, the first thing that had to happen is there had to be the uh, imaging surveys that were done to find the objects that we're going to look at. And so that's now complete, and that's been made public. It's called the DESI Legacy Survey. 
uh, and the latest release was the ninth release called DR9. And it's you can actually go to the web and and you know and it has all sorts of tools for looking at all these objects. There are a bi over a billion and a half objects that have been measured. Hmm. And, and so the early um, data uh, does it um, does it provide any additional uh, uh, additional insights into dark energy? Um, the, you mean the dark energy survey or the uh, legacy? Oh, I guess legacy we don't have any data from Desi yet, right? We haven't got we we have gotten data actually. We've gotten the survey validation data. Oh, okay. okay. And what has that what has that has shown us is that it's performing as expected actually some in some ways better than expected yeah and that it will be able to do the science that we you know that we want to do in in five years yeah so going back to the spectroscope uh, spectrographs uh, and the 15 me 15 minute uh, 5000 photographs that you're taking all of that is so, sort of a status quo measure right um that is one point in time so uh, the three not, not exactly yeah. because yeah. different galaxies will be at different redshifts and yeah. so they will be at different times in the age of the universe and so so when you put the 3d map together if if it were to be realistic at some point in time it has to be corrected for all of that then right well but that's what the redshift tells you it tells you uh, it tells you how far away, how back, how far back in time a particular galaxy that we're viewing is. Yeah, but what I'm confused about, uh, Greg, is that uh, so? Let's say you know we see a galaxy um, a billion light years away, mm -hmm. and we have a galaxy hundred million light years away. Um, and we, when we see these things, as you say, they we are seeing it in different points in time. Mm -hmm. And so, so when we make that 3D map, it's not like the universe existed like that 3D map at any point in time, right? Do I understand it? Well, that's right. Well, it, well, it, no, it didn't. It, 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 what, what happened is the light had to travel to us. Yeah. And so well, as, as we look at a given shell, a spherical shell surrounding us, uh, that light, that, that we're seeing things in that shell thin shell of the same the same age the same point of in time but as we as we look further and further out we're looking further and further back in time and so we have you know like a uh, a ct scan of the universe yeah um so, so we'll take a quick break Greg. Uh, when we come back we'll talk uh, more about your other venture high energy light isotope experiment okay we can do that thanks This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back, uh, Greg. Uh, we were talking about dark energy that is... 70% uh, of the universe, or at least that is what we believe. And you have been involved in multiple experiments to try to tease out uh, what it might be, how it is distributed, and so on. Uh, initially, the dark energy survey that has concluded, good data came out of it. A new experiment called DESI, dark energy spectroscopic instrument, is supposed to give us much, much better information, sort of a 3D map of a, a large number of 35 million galaxies uh, that might give us a, a, a better view into, into dark energy. Um, uh, Greg, I, you know, before the um, break, I was going to ask you, so after we got this 3D map, um, how, do we, how do we utilize that to, to go back and, and ask the question, uh, I asked the questions we asked about dark, dark energy. How, how will the ultimately come together? Happy to answer that question. So the 3D map basically gives us a large number of distances between those galaxies. Yeah. 
and very accurately the, the distances. Now, those distances, uh, those distances tell us, uh, you know, and, and of course we will know as a function of redshift uh, at what point in the universe we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, so we measure these distances, and what we're looking for is uh, this feature caused by uh, sound traveling in the early universe that has led to the structure that we see in the universe today. Uh, yeah. So we look at the separation between galaxies, and that tells us about uh, this, how that feature has evolved. Okay, so the distance between galaxies, lots of those distances, will give us a distribution from which we can measure the competition between dark energy and gravity. Hmm. So we, we, we look for a peak, which has already been observed, the, the barren acoustic oscillation feature, and we watch it with great accuracy over cosmic time. We watch how it evolves. Yeah. And that's how we measure the impact of dark energy and whether it's changed in its nature, in its properties uh, over, over time, or whether it's remained constant. And yeah. then the other thing we do yeah. is we use what's known as redshift space distortions uh, that occur around large concentrations of dark matter, like a galaxy cluster, mm. to observe the distortions in that in that in the redshift distribution that are caused by that dark matter clustering in that galaxy cluster. Now, that tells us how structure grew in the universe, and it gives us a sensitive measure of whether or not general relativity is correct or not in describing gravity. Hmm. So, so the objectives are really broad. So it's not just dark energies. Uh, if I understand this correctly, Greg, so this, this uh, acoustic uh, ripples um, that is uh, s sort of uh, going through the fabric of the universe, our close understanding of that would not only tell us about the evolution of dark energy, but also a lot about dark matter then. Oh, absolutely. We, we met, we, 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 you, see, you see, measuring the what are known as peculiar velocities, the velocities that slightly deviate from the Hubble expansion at any given epoch because of the presence of the dark matter, that tells us where the dark matter is and how dense it is and how much it's collapsed. And so we can watch as a function of time, galaxy clusters collapse, but not just by looking at the galaxies, which represent a very tiny fraction of the mass of these things, we're actually looking at the dark matter. Yeah. And so any debate that still exists um, around dark matter and dark energy, that is just a sort of um, modifications to theory of relativity and, and uh, other, uh, other ideas that we have, any debates around that, this will be able to settle that once and for all. That is our hope, but you know, you don't know what the universe is gonna hand you. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't until you make the measurement. Yeah, that, uh, that kid, you know, who is turning the knobs could always throw a wrench into this. Yeah, look, I, I have been wrong so many times when I would speculate about things that I, I, I no longer, uh, you know, uh, uh, make prognostications of how an experiment will turn out. I, I love to be surprised. <laughs> right, right. Um, then, so there's another one that you're involved in: uh, light energy, light. Sorry, high energy light isotope experiment. This is yeah. it's an Antarctic balloon experiment. Yes, it's. Uh, you know, I I've been doing balloon experiments for well my entire career. I since I was a graduate student, yeah. and um, uh, I love ballooning because it. Uh, it, you know, it, first of all, it involves a very small group. The experiments like DES and DESI, you know, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. Yeah. Uh, but these balloon experiments are a small number of institutions with, you know, a dozen or so, maybe at most two dozen individuals that are working on it. And so it's, it's, it's just more like a family doing the experiment. Mm. And uh, so it's a very different kind of experiment than these very large experiments. 
uh, and it's it, it, it's actually a lot of fun. I mean, to 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 work on something intensely where everybody on the experiment knows every piece of the experiment in great detail and makes their contribution and comes together, makes it work, and then takes it off into the field, in this case to Antarctica, and flies it, it's it's a thrill. It's something that you, you know, it's a, it's a peak experience that you remember for the rest of your life. And so anyway, we've I've been doing these kind of experiments, trying to understand cosmic rays in the galaxy, yeah. not only their origin, but their propagation. Uh, as I said, since I was uh, a graduate student. Yeah. And uh, so the helix experiment, uh, uh, ballooning, ballooning used to take place in the continental United States. Uh, sometimes they would, you know, uh, fly, you know, in more exotic places, you know, sometimes we flew things in Canada. But more recently, ballooning has moved to Antarctica. Mm-hmm. And the reason it's moved to Antarctica is because during the, uh, uh, Austral, uh, you know, the Austral um, uh, 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 summer, yeah. uh, you know, December, you know, December uh, uh, for us, uh, the the sun is up all the time, and that does, you know, f- you know, for the month of December and January, the sun's up all the time, and that does two things for ballooning. First of all, it d- balloons at night when the sun goes down, tend to you know, drop in the atmosphere. They fly at about 120, 130,000 feet. And then they drop down into the atmosphere as the balloon cools, you know, as the sun goes down. And um, these are basically big open bags. They're, you know, 26 million cubic feet of volume. They're huge. And um, and they're carrying a payload that weighs tons. Yeah. And, uh, and so it sinks into the atmosphere and it doesn't rise again. It keeps sinking usually. And so you have to carry ballast normally, to, and you have to drop that ballast. You need thousands of pounds of ballast to stay up, you know, one evening. Hmm. And that's too much to if you wanted to go long, long duration. So in Antarctica, the, it doesn't droop down, and so it can stay up for, you know, weeks. And um, the other thing is that you don't have to carry batteries to power your payload. You can carry uh, solar panels yeah. um, and run it, off, run it off the sun. And that means that the weight of the batteries is not a is not a deterrent to making you know having long flights. So they've had flights in Antarctica now, balloon flights that don't last a day or two, which is what typically happens in the United the continental United States. But they last for um, well, the longest was forty two days, hmm. and so uh, uh, so far. Yeah. And so you launch this thing from McMurdo Base, uh, right off the Ross Ice Shell. It goes up. Uh, flies, you know, roughly in a circle at about 120,000 feet, and the idea is to bring it down someplace where you can recover it. Antarctica is a big place, and it's, it, you know, it, it's an adventure. Every one of these balloon flights is a great adventure, and so I, uh, people who who go on balloon flights, they keep wanting to do it again and again. Um, so and, these are these are about cosmic rays. So what exactly are cosmic rays? Well, uh, cosmic rays are high energy particles that travel through the galaxy uh, and arrive here at Earth. We do not actually know the origin of cosmic rays, but we believe that they are accelerated in supernova remnants. Um, And uh, the supernova remnants are distributed throughout the galaxy. Sometimes there's more density than others, than other places. and uh, and they uh, accelerate uh, cosmic rays of all types. You, they, they accelerate everything up through uranium, uh, and uh, and there's electrons and positrons and there's antiprotons in the cosmic rays. And I've had uh, you know experience measuring you know all of these things, and it's been great fun. But what Helix does is it tries to understand how cosmic rays make it from these uh, supernova remnants or, you know, whatever the source is to us. Yeah. And there are a lot of magnetic fields in the, you know, and there are spiral arms in our galaxy. And um, the, the, the cosmic rays are all jumbled up by the magnetic fields. And so they arrive to us through a circuitous path. Hmm. Sometimes that path leads them through the disk of the galaxy, but sometimes they escape the disk uh, of the galaxy and then re-enter the disk 
and come to, you know, our solar system. And then they have to re-enter the, they have to enter the solar system as well. And so, uh, th these so are, these are real particles like uh, electrons and positrons that are yeah, and, and 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 nuclei like uh, hydrogen, helium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, <laughs> all that stuff, all the way up to uranium. And they're traveling at uh, close to speed of light. Oh yes, that's the whole yeah. point. <laughs> so uh, yes, so we're we're looking at particles that are moving, ne you know, near the speed of light, um, and uh, and that's that's how they can get to us yeah. from far away. Uh, in helix, we're going to be looking particularly at beryllium isotopes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be measuring the isotopic composition of beryllium. Now, beryllium-10 is a radioactive uh, isotope, whereas all the other beryllium is not. Yes. You know, all the other stable beryllium is not. And so when beryllium is produced in cosmic rays, when carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen nuclei smash into uh, nuclei of the interstellar medium, mostly hydrogen and helium. And uh, they break up. And they, in breaking up, they produce lithium, beryllium, boron, and beryllium-10 is a clock, which is finely tuned to the um, uh, confinement time of cosmic rays in our galaxy. And so what beryllium, by measuring the ratio of beryllium-10 to the other beryllium can do, is it can tell us how much time outside the disk versus how much time it's spent in the disk of the galaxy. Because yeah. the, the, the amount of matter they go through tells us how much beryllium is produced. And then by looking at the radioactive species, if it's gone, it means that it spent a lot of time. So just like uh, carbon dating. Exactly. So that's what we want to do. We want to kind of figure out how the cosmic rays propagate in the galaxy and outside the galaxy, you know, as it leaves and then comes back in. And uh, that's what beryllium-10 can do for us. And, and so it's not as um, uh, uh, esoteric as trying to figure out what dark energy is, but it's a, certainly a very interesting problem. And the nice thing about uh, beryllium-10 is if you can measure it at different, uh, uh, different uh, what we call Lorentz factors, in other words, how close to the speed of light it is, yeah. the, the lifetime of beryllium-10 changes because of time dilation. Mm -hmm. And so what we get is a range, if by measuring it over a, you know, at very close to the speed of light, we get a wide range of Lorentz factors and therefore a wide range of, of clock time, you know, clock uh, rates on the, on the beryllium-10. And so uh, if we do this as a function of energy, we can disentangle the information that says how much of it is produced to um, how long it's been traveling. Yeah, that, that's so interesting, uh, Greg. So I always wondered, you know, a photon um, after traveling 10 billion years from our perspective, right. the, it, it did uh, no time, spend no time from the photon's perspective uh, because, of, uh, because of time dilation. Here we have actual proof uh, but by looking at uh, beryllium-10 that uh, we know that that beryllium didn't actually feel a lot of the time. Sure. And so we are looking at beryllium, which has Lorentz factors that vary from, you know, one, in other words, low speed, to Lorentz factors as large as, well, in, in the end, helix will, will go up to a Lorentz factor of about 10. And so we'll get a variation in the lifetime of beryllium-10 of, of basically an order of magnitude. And so, but the key is figuring out how to actually determine that something's beryllium-10 versus beryllium-9. Yeah. And to do that, we're launching a superconducting magnet. That's the part of this that I'm responsible for. Um, the superconducting magnet will bend the particles. And then um, we have other collaborators from other institutions that are building uh, a ring imaging aerogel Cherenkov counter. Have you ever seen aerogel? This, this uh, cloud-like substance that weighs next to nothing if you hold it in the palm of your yeah, hand? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we use aerogel because it has a threshold for Cherenkov radiation. This is, this is the radiation that's produced when a charged particle moves through 
a medium at faster than the velocity of light in that medium. Yeah. And so it produces a shock wave of light, basically, and we observe that. Now, we're using ring imaging Cherenkov counters to measure a circular ring produced by this, this very rapid relativistic particle, beryllium in this case, moving through this aerogel. And we actually image the ring using um, uh, what are called silicon photomultipliers. Uh, they're uh, semiconductor devices that, that amplify uh, the signal that you get when light hits them. Uh, and um, and uh, it does that in a semiconductor. And that's important because normal photomultiplier tubes uh, are not very good in a magnetic field. And so we are using the magnetic field. It's right near a magnetic field. So we use this ring imaging Cherenkov counter. We use a, um, uh, uh, we use scintillators uh, as time of flight detectors to tell us whether the particle is moving up or down because stuff does come from the bottom and things that are moving upward will bend as though they're the opposite charge sign to, you know, to, uh, something moving down and uh, can mess up your measurement. Uh, but they also measure the, the charge of the particle. So we know it's uh, charge four, you know, yeah. which is beryllium. And so we can tell what charge it is from those detectors. And then we, inside the magnet, another one of my colleagues uh, is building a uh, jet chamber. And this jet chamber will track the particle very accurately, track the beryllium and, as it goes through that chamber and measure the deflection. Yeah. So we measure the charge using the scintillators. We measure the velocity very accurately using the ring imaging Cherenkov counter. And then once we have the charge and the velocity, we measure the deflection, which tells us the mass. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. So, but, but I understand that yeah, this is on hold because of COVID-19. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> we were supposed to fly next December. Next December, yeah. And now it looks like it's going to be delayed for two years. Well, yeah. You know, it's, it's very hard to carry out. Well, it's hard to build experiments, and it's also hard to carry them out in Antarctica, you know, when this pandemic is going on. Yeah. It's also very risky um, because you are in a sort of a remote area, right? So oh, that's right. There's, there's no medical attention. I mean, yeah. the, 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 in, in McMurdo, they, they just, and they can't evacuate you quickly in case you have a problem, a medical right. problem. Right. The closest, uh, the closest will be New Zealand, right? That's right. Uh, usually you, you stage the thing in Christchurch, New Zealand, you stage your payload, you make sure it's all working, and then they load you onto a transport that takes you down to the ice. Yeah. Uh, so in closing, uh, Greg, I know that you are working on a, a, a newer toy, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is you want to at least uh, conceptually talk about. Uh, okay, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's just yeah. been published. The, the, the technique has just been published in Physical Review A uh, letters. Anyway, uh, it came from when I was on sabbatical at the University of Hawaii. Yeah. And one of my colleagues there, his name is Istvan Savudi. Uh, he came into my office, he's a theorist. He's a cosmo cosmological theorist. And he came into my office there and he said, you know, these lensed quasars, you know, quas qua quasars, they give off all this light and then the light can bend around uh, foreground galaxy clusters, you know, due to general relativity. Yeah. And sometimes they form multiple images of that quasar. So you see, you know, four spots or three spots that look like this, they're the same quasar. They just bend or they're just bent around the foreground object. And you see three images or four images of quasars, sometimes two images, sometimes a ring. But the point is this, uh, that the, the, the point that Isman was trying to make was that the path that the, that the light takes from the quasar to the earth, when they bend around like this, can vary by as much as a hundred years between one image and another. And he said, is there any way to measure the redshift, the, the, the difference between the redshift, between, um, between the two different images, yeah. so that you could measure directly the expansion, different, the difference in expansion of the universe between, you know, in those, in those hundred years. Hmm. And there's lots of these quasars, by the way, these, these, image, these strongly lensed quasars. 
And my first reaction was, no, there's no way to do it because the emitting source, they're not lines, they're broadened lines because the atoms that emit them are moving very rapidly and you get Doppler shifts and it broadens the lines and it just, you know, slight difference of one part in 10 to the ninth in frequency uh, couldn't be detected with, you know, could, could be buried in this Doppler broadening. And so, but, you know, I love a challenge and I started thinking about it and I started thinking about things like uh, whether maybe you could beat the two sources against each other, you know, like two tuning forks, you know, beat against each other and you hear that woom, 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 woom. Or, you know, if you've played guitar, a 12 string guitar, you know, the strings that are not, that are, uh, you know, tuned to the same, uh, same note. Uh, those strings, they're not exactly tuned to the same node, and they produce this interesting sound, of course, when you pluck them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's because of the beating together of these things. So I was thinking, well, maybe you could make the two sources beat against each other, and it would wipe out this Doppler broadening. And then I thought about a technique that I learned about in graduate school uh, called the Hanbury-Brown uh, twist effect, which involves correlations between the arrival time of photons and uh, so I started thinking about these things with Istvan, and pretty soon it, the mathematics got pretty uh, hairy. And I knew that I had to talk to someone who is an optical physicist who knows these things. So I called up my friend at the University of Michigan, Roberto Merlin, and I said to him, "Can you? Uh, here's the problem. You know, would any of these techniques work?" And he got to work on it, and he figured out. Uh, mathematically, how to make this work. Mm. And, and then my graduate student, Noah, Noah Green, he, he refined the mathematics and made it, you know, really clean. So that mm. even so, even so, it's a little arcane. And it's kind of difficult to accept that you can actually get rid of this Doppler broadening, you know, and, and actually measure the difference very accurately by doing photon correlation studies. Wow. Anyway, so it's a completely new way of doing things because no one's ever put something like this on a telescope to, to you know, to measure, you know, the time of arrival to, to uh, picoseconds, uh, the time of arrival of photons and measure the, all the time differences between them and get a distribution and then pull out this, this fundamental frequency difference between the two, uh, two uh, images. Uh, and, you know, it, it seems almost impossible, <laughs> but the math works. And that's the key. That's what this paper is all about. And so the next step that we're going to do is we're going to try to measure something in the laboratory that has two closely spaced frequencies that are very, you know, th th where there's a line between it, uh, frequency difference, yeah. uh, because that's what it measures. It measures the frequency difference, not the frequency of the line, but the frequency difference, and to very high accuracy. Yeah. And uh, uh, we're trying to measure something, and what, what, what was suggested by Roberto was the lamb shift, which has been measured, but you, in order to measure it and get rid of the Doppler broadening, you have to shoot lasers into it. You have to touch the source. Mm. And our technique uses correlations between photon arrival times, and it doesn't require that you touch the source, which is very important for cosmology. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, yeah. The next thing we're going to do, as soon as we can get back into my lab, yeah. <laughs> with, uh, you know, COVID ending, uh, is to try to measure the lamb shift, which the frequencies differ by uh, basically uh, a gigahertz. And yeah. so we'll try to measure that, that, that frequency difference, which has been done optically using lasers. Uh, but we'll try to see if we can do it with our technique. And if we can do it with our technique, then we're going to try to figure out how to build an instrument that would go on a telescope to do the same thing. And then we'll look at lots of quasars at different redshifts and measure the different the, the frequency difference between the lenses, which would measure the Hubble constant in situ. Yeah, there's this, uh, you know, my, my feeling, uh, Greg, is that if the math works, then we, you will always solve the engineering problem. It's just a matter of time. Well, you know, we have to make we have to make an instrument that basically does what the math says it does. <laughs> and fortunately, there's new technology available that allows you to measure time differences very accurately called superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. And yeah. so I'm going to try to play with those things. Yeah, yeah. But this is how new experiments get done. This is how they get you know, born is you think of something. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. 
but you try it. Yeah, and, and that's a fascinating part of uh, physics, right? Science in general, that you get an idea, you can expand the idea, you can start to do experiments, you can refine your machines and ultimately get to something. Mm -hmm. I, love, I, lo I love building things and making them work. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this has been great, Craig. Thanks so much for spending time with me. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.